Um, yeah. So I think we can just get started. It's all recorded, so. True. Um, hey, everyone. I am Sunny. I'm the program director at Wendy Subway. Um, we're a publisher and library space in Bushwick, and we're really happy to be here um, with Erica and Kite. Um, for the third <clears throat> in a series um, called What Happens After the End. I'll pass it to you, Erica. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm really thrilled to welcome you all to the third and penultimate conversation in this series, What Happens After the End. Uh, the desire to create this series came from a collection of interior curiosities that I've mulled over the last year. Um, they've centered around the desire that we don't go back to normal, which is everyone seems really excited about. Um, and then if we succeeded in resisting that old normalcy, what could we do in its absence? So much um, has been destroyed this past year, which is terrifying yet in certain contexts, hopeful. We've collectively shared a tremendous amount of grief and loss. Many of us have had our lives altered in remarkable ways. So I'm wondering about what has become malleable and open to change during this period of flux. And if this opening can be used as an instrument to make our conditions more humane, more filled with care, more imaginative and beyond the boundaries of what we have previously been forced to contend with. In what ways can we imagine a different way of living after the end? Um, over the last few months and in the next couple, I'll be asking some of the most visionary minds that I know this question of what could be after the end and others inquiring into, the, into community care, collective trauma, and new imaginations. I would like to especially thank Sunny and the whole team at Wendy Subway, as well as Marin Arasanos and Pratt Institute for being such supporters and shepherds of this series and my thinking around it. I'd also like to acknowledge that while reading this, while this reading is happening virtually, it is also being hosted in several locations, two of which are Boulder, Colorado and Brooklyn, New York, which is built upon unceded indigenous lands, specifically the Cheyenne and Arapaho people and the Canarsie and Lenape people respectively. I acknowledge the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color by the US and am aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as standards for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to keep in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability, reparation, and equity. And so now I have, um, I'd like to introduce my guest for this evening, uh, Kite, aka Suzanne Kite, is an Oglala Lakota performance artist, visual artist, and composer raised in Southern California with a BFA from CalArts in music composition, an MFA from Bard's College, Bard College's Milton Avery Graduate School, and is a PhD candidate at Concordia University. Kite scholarship and practice investigates contemporary Lakota ontologies through research, creation, and computational media and performance. Recently, Kite has been developing a body interface for movement performances, carbon fiber sculptures, immersive video and sound installations, as well as co-running the experimental electronic imprint on her records. Kite has also published in several journals and magazines, including the Journal of Design and Science in MIT Press, where the, where the award-winning article, Making Kin with Machines, co-authored with Jason Lewis, Nolani Arista and Archer Pachawis was featured. Currently, she is a 2019 Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Scholar, a 2020 Tulsa Artist Fellow, and a 2020 Women at Sundance and Adobe Fellow. One of the most enjoyable parts over the last couple months has been, for me, has been to dive into Kite's work and theoretical thinking about their art. Kite uses her creative practice to decenter the predominantly white European experience, often entwined with artificial intelligence and art technology. In some of her work, she explores non-human experiences in order to expand the audience's notion of empathy, pushing on the boundaries of relatable experience. In an article about Kite and her work written by Nicole Kelly Westman for Luma Quarterly, Kite is quoted as saying, when I was a child growing up in a small town, my mother would indulge me in a fantasy that I possessed a magical power, the power to change traffic signals. I would wave my hands about elaborately wiggling my small fingers proclaiming change, 
change while my mother would read the traffic and adjusted her speed according to the staleness of the light. She never failed to protect this illusion and with great patience, she continued to foster a magical form of creative thinking in me. In Kite's work, she continues this tradition of creating a generous and magical version of what the world can do with our interaction by allowing us to engage with her art. Later in the same article, Westman says about Kite's work, positioning the measurement of time as a tool for colonial bodies to conquer indigenous peoples, Kite countered objective assumptions of time with her performative thesis in support of Lakota understanding of time. Best understood as a waiting for the right time, Indian time is less tangibly attached to the mechanics of numerics. A simple synopsis of Indian time would conclude that rather than existing at the center of time, the individual is placed within a cycle of time. In this way, and in ways I previously mentioned, Kite continues this work of revolutionary and expansive decentering and realignment in her inspiring work. And I'm so grateful to be able to welcome her tonight. Welcome, Kite. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Um, so before I get too deep into my own curiosities, I wanted to take a few minutes uh, for you to be able to, you know, do a little bit of a show and tell and show share some of what you are or have been working on um, to get us started. Yeah, I think we're going to uh, begin by watching just the beginning of a piece that predates the pandemic uh, called Listener, but I think is a my most complete summation of what how I've felt and how I've worked throughout um, the past year, more almost more than a year now. Um, and uh, it's called Listener. And this piece is made with uh, police scanners, um, uh, long range radio signals, uh, a hair braid interface that controls sound effects and then machine learning uh, software, Wackinator listens to those changes and then changes a dial, a Lakota women's geometric pattern. And then I watch that and make uh, decisions on how to move the braid in turn um, in a circular relationship with the computer. And, uh, the, and I'll, um, I think I'll say more after we watch a few minutes. Is that your registered owner, William McGonagall? His son, same surname, but his given one is Randolph. And the date of birth is 1959, 1220. Mm -hmm. He's standing by in the area, and now we currently have the male on the phone saying he is extremely depressed. His name is Alex. Simultaneously transmit of other listeners in stories traded for carbon. Whisper 
whispers that they desire bind tap or evasion techniques will stay in these cities because they cannot most survivors will stay in these cities because they have roads that lead back the way they came. Classified maps, which all have roads, classified maps, which all have roads that lead back the way they came. Prey on wandering locatable. Prey on wandering locatable. Prey on wandering locatable. Prey on wandering locatable. Sometimes I only imagine I hear a survival technique is to listen. Sector 14. Unfortunately, we've tried all of the numbers and we're not able to get through. At 29 Dolan Drive, 29 Dolan Drive near Green Bank Strandhurst. 53-year-old male, possible CBA, left side uh, going numb, off balance, the onset of Friday. Also has an ear. Now is an incident silence called the future. Stood more than I saw. And while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw. Manner. The shape of all things. For I was seen in a sacred man. Things in the spirit. In the shape of all. For I was seen in a sacred man. Like one bean. People was one of many hoops that made one circle. People was one of many hoops. Daylight. And. Daylight. And there's starlight. And in the center grew one. 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 Saw that it was holy. There. Saw that it was holy. There. One five, five, you need two on the cold floor. Uh, one nine, two, Ogilvy Road. Lost her, small, just, uh, for really a couple of months, Charlie. Yeah, boy. The book of photographs, meet to meet them, and they had a man. He said our other to meet them, and they had a line faced away from the line faced away from the wall in vibrant colors and there were two young men with doll in vibrant colors all i turned pages the more i back to the book and turned more turn between the pages the more i t 46 go ahead all fair and station at 41 until the young men begin until the young men begin until the young men begin and i saw and I saw, and I saw, and I turned, I saw, I saw, I saw. Dark drift, turn toward, verbal drift, verbal drift, verbal drift, verbal drift, verbal drift, come to Verbal drift. Come for the uh, Benson Cartage Center. Come toward. Silently. Audible dream. Hear it. Audible dream. Dream you hear it. Dream you hear it. Dream you hear it. Dream you hear it. You breaking down. You will long before you begin to hear it, and it will be audible. Hear it, and it will be audible. That which you cannot hear is audible. I know you listen to that deteriorating blindness. Darkness you hear. Darkness you hear. How this was built. I am only here. Don't ask me. A bright white sunlit me here to hear it. I echo. Here. I could not begin to tell you, and you could not begin to hear it. Dream you will hear it. Dream you will hear it. I listen to you. Leave. Natural. For me. Uh, this spiral. Unable to open the door. Uh, she was, I guess, screaming for help. Ottawa Housing is uh, already notified that they need you for access. Right. 
didn't. I heard my biometrics. I heard my biometrics. Rejected hierarchies. And that. And that. Yeah, so that was uh, part of listener um, that was recorded live in during a performance in Ottawa. So um, I just edited out a couple people's names and birthdays uh, in post. But um, the I perform I you know have this kind of transmission situation going on. The other thing that's happening is there's a script um, which is on my website I think, but uh, I'm speaking it and it's being algorithmically shuffled as I'm speaking it, uh, which also makes it really difficult to hear uh, for myself. So yeah, it's kind of what is frame sort of a, a concept of transmission um, over long of uh, like unknowable distances. Um, and I, as kind of the, what has carried my practice kind of and been able to make work consistently throughout the, the past year. Yeah, that was um, amazing. I mean, I've seen it before, but it was um, somehow a different experience knowing that other people were also watching it too, because I, um, when I first saw it, it felt divinatory in a way that was very personal. And then um, um, it was powerful to feel it expand to um, several different bodies across space. And I do think it is such a great framing for my question of like what happens after the end because it's kind of like this unknown push forward to end, um, like it's not clear where it's going, but it's definitely going. Um, and, I, and a word that I heard come up again and I took note of it, and again, in the recordings was survive or survivor. Um, and I took a note of that because over the last few months, I have several times to different people expressed my, my discontent with that word because I'm like, when do we get to flourish instead of survive? Um, and so I was, I guess I was wondering if, that that this work or other work was like a an impetus towards that or if you had any thoughts about that sort of transition from those two situations yeah i i think that so this work comes very specifically out of a workshop with the initiative for indigenous futures where i've been a research assistant since 2017 um and so i that's kind of one of the first activities i did there was a workshop um, that Jason Lewis and Scalinati uh, usually do with uh, youth, um, Indigenous youth, but we did it kind of at, uh, with staff and research assistants and other colleagues at Concordia University. And we were at the, the premise is a seven generation character design where you attempt to imagine yourself seven generations in the future or a um, seven generations from you uh, like your children or seven, I like to think of as seven intellectual generations or something, um, artistic generations. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of questions at the table because first of all, there's the complication of where a lot of indigenous people struggle to see their children flourishing, don't, don't see themselves flourishing. Why would you see your, so it's quite difficult to imagine the seven generations, sometimes it's easier to place yourself. I think it's very much an Ojibwe concept where you put yourself in the center and then um, two generations, three generations back, three generations forward sort of thinking, all these techniques to make sure you're not caring for just yourself. You have to think many, many generations ahead and, and plan for that um, always with everything, especially with uh, non-human beings. Uh, and, and in that, you know, there were a lot of, I, I had a friend um, with me at that workshop who was not planning on having children of their own. So, you know, where do you take that sort of in indigenous futurism, um, you know, whose future and um, a lot of, you know, complications with when thinking through that. So, but this piece was, 
still like it still works for my brain especially now because the way that it challenges me to mm. say when I made this piece I was very it's very dystopic um and I now challenge myself to not just imagine dystopias and I really learned that skill I, I mean indigenous futurisms aren't new indigenous futures is a lot of people do it and you know to me mainly addressing this a lot of people smarter than me have articulated ideas of indigenous apocalypse and post-apocalypse existence but um you know the and I, but i've learned so much more um about this practice from afrofuturists uh, uh such as my collaborator alicia b wormsley um where we've been doing these uh, uh black and indigenous dreaming workshops and you know, while I, <laughs> Alicia's always suggesting that the uh, participants use joy to time travel into the future, I always feel the need to qualify it with. I, uh, I mean, sometimes sorrow and joy are quite similar feelings. They're, you know, one is just this balance of the other. And so, you know, sometimes I, I need that to time travel. And then the other thing I feel the need to mark on there is that you know you sometimes seven generations isn't enough and you need to say uh like uh, how about it as long as it as many generations in the as many years in the future as you need to go to find a place where your community needs to be met your community needs to be met that's where we'll that's where you can time travel to and so for some people that's five years and for others it's um millennia so yeah those are kind of my thoughts on that. that's there were so many things in there um at first i totally um relate to this qualification that like sorrow also needs to be a part of it i get um i've had these conversations about my own work of like well are you hopeful or are you hopeless i'm like i think probably both and so <laughs> bringing both of those things um and letting them exist at once feels really important to this question and so I have this other question for you, but you did kind of already answer it, but I'm going to read it anyway, just because it's funny that you answered it. Um, so um, a lot of your work explores the way technology and artificial intelligent intelligence can intertwine with or expand the traditions um, or history of a Guala Lakota culture. And I'm interested in how time operates in the, these instances, braiding history and futurism. This method of inquiry you've implemented feels useful to think about, useful to think about moving into future post-pandemic-ish life. And so can futurism be a way of preserving a history and bringing it into the future as a means of survival? It's going back the way of moving forward. And I feel like you did answer that, but I wanted to bring it into this space anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, um, I think that I, I'm a new future. Like I, I've learned this like concept of future from Scawinati and from other indigenous futurists who have worked for decades to make it possible for someone like me to make work in this vein. Um, and I really, because it's very, it's very recently that it was okay for indigenous artists to use technology, computers and technology with their work. And so, and I think futures is is similar and. I think there's, there's a lot of energy around decolonial uh, thought and futures right now, but you know, I'm the futures thing doesn't doesn't take me it takes me pretty far, um, but it doesn't take me as far thinking wise as I want to go. I'm more I'm so I'm very invested in well first of I I I like to use so one of the pieces that I use thinking about time and structures of time mostly is with someone's doing an epic drum noise set in the room next to me. <laughs> I hope you can't hear it. But uh, there's, a, there's a piece called Everything I Say is True um, where I'm trying to use it, like trying to conflate um, uh, kind of my made up version of Lakota linguistics, where there's this concept in Lakota linguistics, it's not a concept, it's just a, a, a function where the past and present ten tense are one tense, and future tense is a separate tense. And I like to conflate that with um, 
in this piece uh, with uh, different physics theories and see how far I can go with the metaphor before it just becomes non-functional. Um, because I, I found that it there's a lot, I don't know, sometimes you hear these, sometimes I hear concepts of native time where it's like a, a time's all, all circular. And in this past last piece, there's a lot of circular, it's, it's, a, it's a spiral time that I'm playing with, but it's actually really not that simple. Um, like, like any philosophy, the depth of complication, especially with time is just like infinite. Um, but the one thing that helps me get out of that rut is, is not only investigating, you know, why, how, it's how we know the things we know and, and how that knowing is structured. So for example, like right now, my research and artistic practice is completely obsessed with methodology. Like how does one make a new artwork in a Lakota way? Like, well, how do we prioritize that? I mean, I don't have any, I don't have a lot of work about it yet, but you know, what is this, how do, has dreaming specifically in Lakota culture make new knowledge? And, and how impossible it is to un, like completely unlearn that artistic methodology. Like it's, it's value, it can be valued in different ways, but the, mess, the practice of it can't go anywhere. So um, yeah, that's one way of trying to work through because dreaming, dream time is so clearly separate from waking time. Um, and um, there are, many really interesting mechanisms in Lakota thought uh, where, where new knowledge can be made. And, and this isn't dreaming, just sleep dreaming, it's wake dreaming too. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I'm gonna like go back to this recording and think about it because I think um, so many things that you said were useful, but something I'm thinking about right now is like, so outside of my window is a snowstorm. Um, and it's the middle of May and I hate it, but um, thinking about time is just like diff, like dream time, circular time, like there's like different um, characteristics. Um, and then I'm like, maybe this is just snow time. And maybe it's just like pandemic time and it's not don't like it has different rules and physics attached to it and maybe that'll that could take us farther than um having to attach it to some other way of time that we're used to um and so this is a question that I ask everybody that I have on this series um because so okay so the uh, the root of the word apocalypse in English means to uncover or reveal um, and I love that etymology. Um, and a lot of your work is heavily experimental or seems to stem from an original experimental what if see. And so I was wondering if there are ways that this like apocalyptic uncovering in the realm of the experimental are sort of related. Like is, is there a movement towards uncovering or, you, or is it kind of just like whatever happens? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm very much, I'm not a good experiment. I do, of course, I know I'm experimenting, but I'm not a good experimenter. Like there's something, of, maybe I could blame it on like a distrust of the Western scientific experiment, but I don't think that's it. I think I just really want to know specific things. And when the answer comes, that's what it is. Um, and I, I, I'm also bad at editing or revising or doing a second take. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not a great improviser, actually. Um, I, can, I can do okay, but the, yeah, but uncovering um, kind of in the intellectual terms, that's really what I want to do. And so it's funny because this, this, when you were, you're, you know, talking about different rules in physics for different time, I, you know, my reaction to that is that, that that's what um, a recent publication that I was, uh, you know, co-coordinator or global coordinator for with the Indigenous Protocols and Artificial Intelligence position paper and where we're really saying that protocols are the difference. Um, having protocols means having responsibility and um, 
you know, these, it is true, there's different times for different parts of the year. And that's like just kind of a basic protocol. Like you won't, you, you don't tell a certain story. I mean, I've heard Archer Pachawa say this many times. You don't tell a certain story at a certain time. There's a reason, deep, nearly unknowable reason, I would say, that you don't tell a story outside of winter time. Um, and, and that has to do with non-human beings and knowledge that isn't easily explained in words. But but that's uh, you know so this idea of uncovering um, is you know rings very true to myself and kind of uh, you know I really like to over intellectualize stuff I know that and my my grandfather was always like not not less of this like more of this and um, which I really need to hear but one thing that I've uncovered for myself uh, is thinking about um how much Lakota philosophy and Lakota thinking prizes unknowability and and what you're uncovering is more and un, more of the unknown. Um is a paper that's in review. I, I, maybe they'll let me publish it, maybe not, but it's okay if they don't, about uh tr trying to work through concepts of of actually starting with like American paranormal mythologies and, and UFO mythologies to try to pinpoint for myself what the difference between the relationship with the unknowable in America versus the unknowable to the Lakota is. And and I think that's um, and on the epistemological level where I see so much possibility to uncover the um, our relationships with the like the, the word Wakan, the word sacred in Lakota, um, sometimes defined uh, by this um, anthropologist uh, David C. Posthumus says uh, that which cannot be understood, and to and that's really when you when I think about it, you know, what's knowable is not holy um, emotions and intellect, uh, a power, physical power, all of that is knowable. And we, no, none, none of that. <laughs> well, well, the, the, the really serious un, unknowability is, is where things become interesting. And then that arches over in thinking about non-human beings and how we can communicate with them, how we can respect them, how we develop protocols for them, different rules, different physics, as you said, yeah. Yeah, um, and you said, um, you said the word responsibility. And so I wanted to jump to this because in one of your other texts, you said it's our responsibility to listen. And um, I really loved this sentence because it implicates the audience as well as the artist. Um, and implication has been another running theme in this series. Um, who should be implicated and how and how much and should art do that and why? And um, and I think oh, for a lot of people, this answer changes based on whether we're in the realm of art or the rest of the world. And I and I and I'm wondering if that should be troubled. Like, should there be a difference in implication between like walking down the street and making a piece of work? Um, and so I guess that's my first question around responsibility and implication. Yeah, I'd say that's like the difference between. Well, there's a lot of difference between indigenous art and the rest of art, <laughs> but one of them is this thing that we're we're, we're responsible. For, well, it depends on who you ask, but to me, I, I think that generally we're we're held responsible to, to family and community, and I feel very responsible to non-human communities, um, and it's it's to try to escape that with putting the word art on there is what doesn't work. I mean, that's what's so interesting to me about uh, trying to understand what kind of knowledge, the process of knowledge making in making artworks, um, let's say a hundred years ago. So my, my great, great, great grandmother or something sits down to make an artwork. And uh, of course it's functional, first of all, it's made of all, all only made of very clear non-human beings um, you know, who have, we have covenants with um, to uh, exchange and be reciprocal to and towards in order to use their bodies to make things. And then um, the use of them 
allows a channel to open to other non-human beings which aren't even easily perceived in, in other worlds and that's you know the the layer the extreme layers of protocol and process and responsibility are it's, it's, it's actually quite difficult to all parse out because there's so many um, and then then the final if you want to bring it to capitalism the the final exchange of making something they're only gifts we, we only ever made things as gifts so uh you know it's not to say that there's not you could put politics to those gifts um and uh not to say that's not there or they could be gifts given to do political work but um uh the the reality is that um it's a different process that hinges com almost completely on re reciprocity and responsibility and um, this like word protocol is like changing my life because I feel like there is this um, really frustrating wall I come up against when I go into art spaces where it's like, oh, well, you just like do what you feel and you like, you like kind of like, it's like intuitive and like that's how you know if it's ethical or not and or if it's the right thing to do in that moment and I feel like the way you're framing the word protocol means like, well, actually there's like a structure to dreaming and to like these things that are very, very old. And um, the there's just like so much history and such a well that's like not being tapped into. I feel like when these things are normally being talked about. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that word. Um, and in the context of like putting yourself with other bodies, um, I had another a question about another piece of work that you made, um, People You Must Look At Me, which is um, this really beautiful uh, composition. Um, and the arrangement was like so emotionally tactile for me. Um, in the description you wrote about the complications of contextualizing the self um, and how you explored it in this piece, um, which seems like a really important question for this year and it struck me that this is a piece where you had guest musicians actually perform and so I was interested in this idea of contextualizing the self through the partial assistance of other bodies and what that was like yeah um that's a good question um you know thinking about I do a compositional process for making recorded compositions that I'm not sure I've heard anybody else do it because I, I found it was the best way to get towards new sounds that I have no way I could arrange myself. Uh, so for example, I'm having, um, so I, 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 the process is I create a drone or a loop and then I put in the headphones of um, improvisers and the thing about good musical improvisers is there's no point in giving them notes that whatever they can do is going to be way more amazing than I could ever write down that's why they're so good at what they do and so I think in that piece it was Mastner Roberts on saxophone and um, Mary Lou Donovan who's, who's now in Leia amazing band um, on harp and my aunt Alicia Seagal's on violin fiddle um, and uh, you know one of the things about giving them this you know handing this these sounds over to them and putting the headphones is then I take away the sound and they never hear each other and I, it's all um, kind of in the magic of arrangement so I think allowing them to find magic separate from me um, and within structure. I mean, that's where, I, that's, at some point, I became very interested in the way structure can do, can possibly make new, no help make new knowledge or frame new knowledge. And so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, it, it's like, you can't force these things necessarily, but I'm not sure if it contextualizes me, but I definitely want to trust my collaborators in the process, especially with with, with sound. Um, yeah, and as I was 
That makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I actually, I, maybe you wrote it or maybe I missed it that like, they're not listening to each other. So that like adds a whole other layer um, of magic on top of it. Um, and then on the opposite end of this, and I, um, you have this piece, Better Off Alone, which I think originally debuted in 2018, which I was like, I reread that date like four times because I was like, they had to have just made this. <laughs> like, this is like, it's so weird. Um, because it felt like an inverted time capsule. I don't, I don't know. Time was like doing like a weird shape in that moment. Um, cause it's, it, I think anyone listening, you should, I, if you can look up, um, on Suzanne's website, this installation is like this hyper intimate separation, which is like my experience of the last year personally. So I wonder if this idea of like enclosed intimate, intimate aloneness has shifted for you at all this last year. Yeah, I made, I, I maybe I could count them quickly. I made like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 pieces just in 2020 between when the pandemic started in the end and I was like I I had nothing else to do besides either panic or make stuff over the internet um and then this year I mean I'll, I'll put it in the chat but I'll just I don't know if it'll still be up but it's um asart.org slash archive slash loner dash culture dash two dash zero and this is like a it's a online version of the piece and you can type in and you can similar experience to playing the keyboard in the gallery and the because I made the piece that piece is so I was trying to just actually just needed a, re a receptacle for my collection a couple collections of things which actually I'm going to expand to be a, rece a receptacle for any collection of anything I ever want to have an excuse to keep um, because I had a I had rave flyers, um, which I've, I got rid of a lot of them because I was like, at some point when I was in my twenties, I was like, I'm done with this. Um, I gotta stop doing this. <laughs> and then, uh, but I managed to go track down a lot of them. And, um, and for my collection of candy from raving and um, I'm the collection of uh, called the jungle jungle sample pack from uh, Blue Martin and um, collection of YMCA Indian princesses memorabilia because I was an Indian princesses and um, other like native crafts that my parents didn't know how to facilitate. I was adopted so they didn't know how to facilitate nativeness. <laughs> I goes in, I did a lot of uh, Pocahontas crafts because it was like 1994 when that came out or something. So a lot of Pocahontas, Pocahontas memorabilia. And, and then um, I'm going to start to add a new collection of things, which is um, uh, my, my biological mother, Cynthia, passed a few years ago. And I've got some of her things, and we're supposed to not keep them in our culture, but I just can't, I don't, want, don't know what to do with them, really. So I really think a museum should just do an experimental archiving of this piece where the computer, the chat room lives online forever. Um, can be hooked up to if it gets installed, but uh, they have a, a special section of the archive of mm, this weird slices of Indian contemporary life, which is very little of it is in any museum, let alone contemporary museum. Um, and just let me for the rest of my life continue to add things. Um, my life, my grandmother's life, my birth mother's life, um, because there, I, I couldn't ever reconcile this I was actually really bad at using the internet when I was not bad at using the internet bad at like talking to people when I was a raver um we'd have these chat rooms and um uh, like message boards message board culture and I was so scared to write anything and not be cool um and it's very terrifying and people oh, people have roast me so hard and just have to take it and be the noob but um you know, it's like that combined with I knew that my 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 birth mother also had raved in Santa Barbara uh, before I was born, and um, you know, there's just like 
it's like something about like multiple generations of like cultural loneliness and then like the need to like get on the computer and like find people um and so then you know all of that to say that the it's a chat room that when you type um you it makes drum and bass um but the the pace at which you type defines if it sounds musical or not and so if you type really fast and confidently it just sounds like noise but if you type slowly and like terrified like i did it'll be drum and bass that's um so tender like that secret um <laughs> and i think that that is an amazing hack that we should all take with us into the future of like if you don't want to get rid of all of your stuff you pitch it to a museum that's like <laughs> It, it very much reminds me of like Fred Bolton's under commons where he like advocates for stealing from the, from the institution and he's like yeah you just get in there and take whatever you can and I'm like yeah have them host our life. Um, so at this point, um, if the audience has any questions, I will. We are here for them. And we can wait a minute or two for those to come in if they do I know. It's funny that you, and I think it's a great way to end because I also think that this like Zoom event thing has like brought out that shy noob <laughs> in everybody. So like typing things in the chat gets very tenuous. So we we understand. Um, I mean, while people make uh, form thoughts, I mean, I really good to ask questions or else I'm gonna say the same thing every time I talk, but the um i just want to men mention something I, I wanted to say in passing about protocol which is you know not out not everybody's into protocol I, I really am quite attached to uh leanne simpson's book uh as we have always done and and in it there's a, talking a lot about when we if we want indigenous resurgence like what what parts of it do we want you know it's it's you know leanne simpson makes it very clear that um so a lot of protocols exclude um, queer, two-spirit, and women um, uh, people. And uh, if that's the, if the indigenous resurgence doesn't include all of our kin, we don't want it. Um, and I really um, learn a lot from from that book. I read it constantly. So. Great, thank you. I can't wait to be able to read for pleasure after this thesis is done for me. <laughs> Um, it doesn't seem like there's any questions, but, um, you know, uh, thank you so much for being here. This was amazing. Um, super grateful for this conversation. Um, and thank you all of you that have tuned on and tuned in and will tune in in the future. Um, I think this is a great thing to watch in the future, especially. Um, the last uh, installment of this series is next month. And it will be um, with Eileen Musa, and I will actually be traveling to Utah um, to, oh, cool. yeah, to visit them on their in their ghost town that they own, which is another kind of future. So um, thank you all, and have a lovely night. And um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>